posso andare. Ok. So we can start for today. Today we'll uh, uh, play with the client side of web programming. Uh, basically, the main topic uh, will be to introduce ourselves to JavaScript. And it's, uh, it's a, a topic uh, that we will, uh, let's say, distribute between today's class and Thursday's class also. Hmm? Before, before starting the main topic, which is JavaScript, uh, I still have to say some words about one left leftover topic from last class when I introduce you to the style sheets, CSS. And uh, at the end of the class last time, I told you, OK, you can, you can do a lot of stuff with CSS, especially, and, and things start to get complex, especially when you are trying to do layouts uh, with complex, uh, say, uh, shapes. But uh, we don't care about, or we don't need, say, to delve in all the details about CSS layouts because we will use one library that will help us. And so it's time to introduce this library first. So we are between today and Thursday. We are playing with client-side technologies. We don't, we won't touch the server side too much. And uh, uh, the addition or the library that we will use uh, to help us developing faster with the uh, study sheets uh, is uh, the Bootstrap framework. Bootstrap is a library made of a combination of uh, CSS files and a bit of JavaScript that was developed originally by the Twitter people. So Twitter uh, developers needed uh, to have a very fast and flexible layout engine, and they developed their own internal library. And at a given point in time, they decided to distribute it uh, in, the, in an open source format. So this is the libra layout library that is being given to us and donated, let's say, by the Twitter people. And it's very uh, efficient and actually a lot of other websites started to use it because we'll see it's quite easy to use. So some, some words about uh, what is it. Uh, right now, it's an open source framework. It, I, I don't call it just a library for two reasons. One uh, uh, is the CSS does, doesn't have the, the notion of, li of libraries. They only have uh, files or rule sets, so they will not apply. But then it's not just CSS only or just uh, one set of uh, CSS rules, because it all also has internally, we don't see it, we don't need to understand them by now, also some JavaScript uh, uh, commands uh, mainly for animations and for customization. And what uh, Bootstrap does is uh, to uh, help us to apply very quickly, very easily, modern styles to our applications. If you, like we did up to now, uh, if you try to use uh, the normal layout of HTML, it's a bit uh, old looking, okay? It's a bit uh, uh, boring. Uh, with, uh, with CSS, uh, we, uh, we have a lot of uh, other, say, visual facilities and also layout facilities that help us a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, it's easy to apply custom themes uh, and uh, if you can develop your own team, you can apply it on top of basic uh, bootstrap uh, uh, rules and layouts. But uh, it's very easy also to find a lot of existing uh, themes uh, that you just need to apply to your own. And uh, maybe the, the most important, apart from the layout, you know, the, the pleasing uh, aesthetical, uh, say, shape of our application, the main uh, issue is that uh, Bootstrap already takes care of uh, a lot of cross-browser issues. So when you have a style sheet that works well with Safari but doesn't with Chrome, and there's some issues with uh, Firefox, uh, and maybe doesn't render quite well in the mobile versions. 
So if I have to list uh, uh, the possible browsers in which my application has to work, I always have a long list between desktop browsers and uh, mobile browsers. And uh, the developers of CSS already know all of this, test all the platforms. And uh, for example, one very, say, uh, uh, common uh, layout uh, detail is having rounded corners to something. So something is not just square, but it has some rounded corners. And, and you will find that every browser does this in a different way. And they have all the rules and all the adaptation to, to work well in the same way in all the browsers. So um, this uh, is uh, a big simplification for us. And mainly, the layout model of Bootstrap is very, very simple. And it's, well, extremely simplified over the basic uh, CSS layout model. So uh, basically, in, uh, in CSS, you have to deal with the, the boxes and the, the, their margins and their floating properties and then alignment and so on. It's a lot of details to get things right. In uh, Bootstrap, you only have uh, your screen and, you, and it's already automatically divided in 12 equally spaced columns, virtual columns. And you just have to say that, OK, this content will take four of these. And so it will automatically apply to one third of the, sc one third of the screen, and everything is laid out uh, uh, automatically hmm, for you. So it's much, much simpler. And uh, the philosophy is that how, how can I program something from HTML to apply CSS, to apply styles? The idea was quite simple. Um, Bootstrap defines a lot of classes. So you will find out that you will add a lot of class attributes to your HTML elements. And each of these classes will apply a given style, bootstrap, bootstrap style, or a combination of classes, actually, will apply a combination of styles. So actually, uh, there are mm, several say, basic classes that are documented on the website to transform, even radically, I would say, one element, one basic HTML element, into the styled version according to CSS. And you just need to, to apply classes. Hmm? Uh, in some cases, you also have some additional components that are not just classes to uh, insert into the page. Hmm? Uh, so for example, um, a menu item is not a single and individual HTML element. It's composed of a group of them, and so you can just insert all of them in one step. We'll see some examples of bo both of classes and components, right? And the last point is uh, the, oh, the whole bootstrap is built uh, with a mobile-first uh, uh, mentality, a way of thinking. Mobile-first means uh, try to target first mobile devices. Try to create a website that works on mobile devices. So uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, the basically that the screen size is very unknown. So you may have a very narrow screen because you have a small smartphone in a vertical orientation. You might have a wider screen if the same smartphone is uh, uh, rotated differently, or if you have a tablet, you can have a larger screen. So the, the, you have a very strong unknown, which is the white and the height, but it's less important, of your device. And you need to fit your website into that. Viewport is called the technical term, uh, the space in which the, the, the page will be laid out. And so. Uh, a responsive technologies are able to change the layout of elements according to the size of the viewport. I can specify very easily in Bootstrap that, OK, these two will go side by side if the resolution is enough. Otherwise, they will go one on the bottom of the other. Or I could also choose that some element will not be shown in the mobile version. 
but I will never say mobile version. I will always say when the resolution is smaller than a given threshold. So Bootstrap gives you five or six different uh, thresholds, small, extra small, large, extra large, and so on. And just you have to decide for each of them which blocks will show on which sizes, and, and, and larger, of course. Huh? So uh, you, you just have to reason about this, and then all the rest is taken care of by the library. So whether you have, you, you can rotate your smartphone and the website changes because the contents are shifted around because the white has changed. Or you can resize your browser window and you see that objects will uh, move hmm? or disappear when you are through to short. Hmm? So this is the, uh, the idea, taking the, the, the constraints that you have when you develop for mobile application and use them as a general method for defining the layouts. This will also have the impact that your web application will, be, will run quite easily on mobile devices. So in many cases, you won't need to develop native applications, but you can just rely on a web application. <coughs> Using Bootstrap is very simple. Very simple because uh, you just have to import, to link, the CSS version. There's a minimized version which is smaller because it doesn't have any all the spaces, all the comments inside. And you have the basic library that defines the basic class, classes. And then you apply a theme on top of the library. So the library just defines the, the, the classes. It's quite neutral. And then you define a theme that gives uh, all the fonts, uh, colors, uh, and shadows, uh, and the sizes, and so on. And you can modify them. And Bootstrap also comes with the default theme. Uh, the Bootstrap theme is called uh, to, to start with. But you can, you, if you search around, you can find a lot of Bootstrap themes. You just have to change the themes uh, and keep in the same uh, uh, Bootstrap. And finally, you just need to have a very uh, short pa uh, part of uh, JavaScript uh, that you need Im to import in your page also. So you have to add these three items into your templates. And we'll see that it's easy to, uh, to do with a Flask extension. And then uh, you can start using the uh, Bootstrap classes. Yes, there's a question? Is the library itself? The second idea. Is the theme? The theme means the um, aspect. You can have one theme giving you, I don't know, gray style websites. Another with fancy colors, bigger fonts, uh, maybe for children. Okay, and so uh, it gives a visual appearance. Basically, the, the set of the the swatch of colors and the sizes of fonts and so on to apply. Hmm? The, yeah, the first one will give you, uh, uh, will not change very much the look of the website. Will give you extra capability for layout, but will not change the look of the level. With both, because you need the, the basic layout engine and the style to apply to it. So you need both of them, okay? The first one is very neutral. It doesn't change the visual appearance. It gives you the layout capabilities and the, and the responsive capabilities, but not uh, fonts and colors and shadows and so. Um, so you can either download these files, one, two, and three, and put them into the static folder of your website and link to those static files. Or otherwise, you can just let, uh, if your application, or your, the, the user of your, of your application is always connected to the internet, you can also leave uh, this uh, address and this will be downloaded directly from uh, the Bootstrap uh, um, servers hmm? instead of your local server. It's the same. Um, the, the advantage of downloading it from the CDN, um, these big websites, have, many have this sort of CDN stands for Content Distribution Network. A lot of servers in different places of the world that host content to be and the, the, the closest mirror will give you the content. 
And the advantage is that uh, if you are navigating three or four different websites, and all of them use Bootstrap, and all of them download Bootstrap from their CDN, then your browser will only have to download it once at the beginning. Then you will have it in, in the cache. Otherwise, if every web server offers, let's say, Bootstrap from local files, we will download many different copies, one for, per website, because the browser doesn't know <laughs> whether they're going to be uh, identical or not. But it's just a, um, a minimal, uh, let's say, uh, difference in, in timing, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have an impact unless you have uh, millions of visitors, let's say. OK. So uh, let's have a look on how to orient ourselves with Bootstrap. So this is the main website. It's called getbootstrap.com. And uh, you have one quite useless getting started section that tells you a lot of uh, details, uh, but mainly gives you these three links. Uh, so if you want to download it, you can copy and paste into your page, or in our case, into our template or the Flask. Uh, and then a lot of other details about compiling yourself, installing with different uh, systems, and so on. The uh, other interesting part of uh, the Getting Started page are these uh, examples here. You have some examples made with this library, with the basic template. We have quite a dozen of them. And you can sh see how they are done. So for example, you want to, I click on this. You want, you need to have some buttons or tables or labels uh, in your website. Uh, so you want to see how they are done. You just click on the team. You view the source and or inspect the source. And you see that, OK, this button has a class BTN, BTN default. Means button and then button default. Or primary or success or information or warning. It's always a button but it will be shown with different colors. And these are the conventional colors. What makes uh, success green and warning uh, orange is the theme. If you change the theme, the same concept, uh, being the success button or the warning button, still applies, but maybe the visual appearance will be different. Maybe they have an icon on the, the side or, or anything else. Uh, also, for tables, you see that you have a table here, a set of tables with very nice borders and shadings. And they are done very easily because you just need to, uh, to add the class equal to table. And uh, it, will have, uh, it will have basic borders like this, the first one. You can add uh, table striped, class table and table striped. And you have uh, gray stripes, uh, no, alternate lines in the, I don't know if you see that in the projector, but, and so on. So you can have a look at the examples and find uh, uh, the classes. You see that the HTML is quite clean. It doesn't have a lot of comments. Only it's just a normal page with extra classes here and there. And if you want to see which are the main classes to apply, you can go to this uh, CSS portion of the website that has more or less documentation for everything. So in getting started, we have, we have the examples. In CSS, we have, uh, let's say, the documentation for these classes. And it's divided into different uh, groups. Uh, uh, for example, for, uh, I mentioned tables before. So if you go to tables, it will give you examples with the class to apply to get this effect. If you add this class, you get this effect and so on. Border to have also vertical borders and so on. And also playing with the spacing, uh, changing the color in a different way uh, according to uh, success info warning or danger classes, and so on. 
So everything about the classes that you can apply to tables are here. If you want to have nice looking forms, just compare with the forms that we developed in the last week. You have uh, text inputs with the rounded corners, with a, sh with a sort of a shadow that uh, is visible when you select them. You can enter data. You can also click on a label to, to get to the, to the, to the input uh, text and so on. You submit buttons. You know, it's the same form as we do normally. It's the same form. You see here that you have, let me make it a little bit, little bit, a little bit bigger. You have an input type email, class form control. And this class form control transforms the normal, boring looking uh, text area into this rounded corner, uh, full white uh, text. And the same for the others. For uh, the, but the submit button has a class a button and button default and makes it look like this instead of uh, the, the, the normal HTML button. But you may have maybe a smaller form. Imagine the login form. So you want to put the elements uh, on the same line instead of uh, one, uh, one above the other. You just have to do to apply a class forming line to the form element. And so the same form will be formatted into one line instead of uh, one column, and so on. You can also format them into a sort of a grid, names on the left, text on the right, instead of labels on top and uh, text uh, on the bottom, and so on. So you can see, you see the This page is also done, of course, with Bootstrap. And you have, we, have, we have seen an effect of the responsive layout. Do you remember that on the right, I had a list of different table button forms and so on? And now it's not there anymore, because I increased the magnification of the text. If I decrease the text, it will hopefully appear again. So this is a part of the page that has been set to appear only on white pages. And if you go there, responsive utilities should be here. You have some classes that say visible access, visible SM, visible MD, and so on. There are some classes that makes a given part of the page, a div, usually, only visible in the extra small, or in the small and medium, or the medium, or the large version. Or in the other case, whether it's hidden in this kind of version. So for each of these uh, big, uh, say, categories of sizes, you can decide which uh, element to show or not. You see that something is visible on medium. This we are right now with the current resolution, we are medium. And if I shrink it, okay. I'm, I'm going too small, and you see that uh, the, uh, it's not easy to see because everything, everything changes, but uh, it will tell me, okay, we are green only on small and medium, but the large will not be visible here. And if uh, I increase it, okay, so. So uh, we have this, uh, Easy classes to make uh, blocks of things uh, appear or disappear depending on the width. Uh, and also, the other useful, useful let's say, feature is uh, the grids. The grid system in Bootstrap. Again, with just by applying classes. Uh, every time you have uh, one page, this page is divided into 12 columns. 12. You cannot make it 15. 12 is a number which is easy to divide in 2, or in 3, or in 4. OK? So that's why they chose 12. 12. So if you want to have one page 
divided in two equally spaced columns, two equally wide columns, you just apply one six column uh, on the leg, um, say division on the left and a six column division on the right. So M D, uh, call MD6 uh, means uh, take six columns out of the 12 available ones. Let's, let's see the code example. Division, class row in this case, and this division is subdivided into two, two classes, each taking six columns, one and two. And then inside this division, you can do whatever you want. The flow with the, well, the column of, will, take, will fill in the text, uh, they, they will go down, but they will keep one on the side of the other. Um, if you want to have three columns, you just take, divide the, the, the full row into three division of columns, or four columns each. Or maybe you have uh, two thirds and one third. So eight on one side and four on the other. The only rule is that everything should add exactly to 12. Otherwise, things start, start shifting in the wrong places. And for this to work, there's only a small trick to remember, is that you must have, at the top level of the page, one division with class container or container fluid. Because the, the division that you mark with a class container will be the reference of your layout, will be the 100%. If you put it in the top, inside the body, it will take over all the page. Otherwise, you can lay out only a small uh, portion of the page. Um, but it's not suggested. And um, so the difference between, so you must have a div con class container at the beginning, and then inside you can have many divs on which you can specify column MD 5 or 6 or 3 or, three or, what, or what you want. You may also have a container fluid, which uh, is more flexible. A container fluid tries to adapt to the full height of the viewport uh, proportionally. Instead, the normal container will have a fixed uh, height. Um, there are also details about uh, specifying how many columns I should take on different sizes. Take an example, let's try to read the first row, just to have a flavor. Call XS12, call MD8. Means that if the viewport is extra small, XS, then it will take all the 12 columns. If the viewport is medium or, or larger, I will only take eight columns. And uh, here it says that, uh, of course, the, uh, with uh, medium, I will take the extra four columns. I, I think this example is wrong because 12 plus 6 is not... Uh, is 18 is not uh, the normal 12. OK, and then you have uh, uh, all the details about laying out the system. So basically, you have uh, tables, forms, buttons that can be of different types. Everything documented here. And all of them apply the same rule. Apply just some classes, and then the size, the layout, the color, and also, in some cases, the behavior will change. So this will help you style the normal HTML elements. You may have maybe to add some divs to contain, to delimit the portion that you want, but this is normal HTML as a structuring. The next step I mentioned before are components. So when you want to do something more complex, you may have a, a group of elements that play well together. For example, 
you know, button groups. I have a group of buttons I want to show together with, uh, and they want them to have uh, the same size and to be equally spaced and so on. And so, this, for example, button groups, uh, we'll give you an example here. And this button, you see, they are joined together. And uh, you have the example here with the class button group uh, with the buttons uh, inside. The difference between normal classes and components is that in components you must also follow the right template uh, for HTML code. Normal booster classes may apply where you want them. If you want to make a, say, a good looking component, you must apply, you must follow this structure of the HTML also. And uh, I, navigation bars, for example, navigation bars are useful for at the top level of the page huh, for selecting the section of the website to show. And so you have just one class navigation of types type, and then every item, in this case, you say it requires you to implement navigation as the UL, a numbered list, like a bullet list. But when it's styled with another element, it will become a navigation bar, in this case. And each list item, uh, will be styled in a different page. One can be made active as default, but you can also have navigation bar in different uh, forms, for example, buttons, or uh, a sort of a menu, selection menu, and so on. So something which is would be very complex to accomplish uh, in basic CSS, it's quite easy because you just have to follow this HTML template, and then apply these three or four classes. Hmm? This is the philosophy of, uh, of Bootstrap. Dropdowns is another useful item here. Uh, having a menu that will appear or disappear, and it just uh, amounts to apply the class dropdown menu, and then everything is done for you. So all the sub-items will be hidden until somebody will click on the menu. Last one can be, that can be useful is the Jumbotron. It's a funny sounding name. It means basically a portion and wide portion of the your web page which is put in evidence with a background so to style your news or uh, something that you want to highlight in the front page. So it's a div class Jumbotron, makes it a wider, wider fonts and standing out. And the colors, of course, of course depend on the style. Um, so, yeah, here, it's the same in the case internet didn't work. We have also some easy way of uh, importing uh, Bootstrap into Flask applications. So we are putting everything together, okay? We are not finished yet. <laughs> uh, HTML, CSS for styling them, Bootstrap library to make us more proficient and uh, uh, to, make, to make better use of CSS. And then how to use CSS into Bootstrap. Sorry, Bootstrap into Flask. Well, there's nothing special. You just have your the, to include those elements into the, the, the template of every page. This can be boring. And so there is a very small Flask plugin. So it's a Python library that plugs into Flask that is called Flask Bootstrap. So you can install that uh, at this address. It's a pip install uh, Flask Bootstrap. Or you download it and install it by hand, but usually with, with pip uh, it's easy. And uh, 
you can see it's a very short documentation. It's here. It just gives you a way for easily creating HTML templates that include all the bootstrap calls. So basically what we will do at the end is that in our templates, we put up one first line here with this statement. Extends is a sort of inheritance among templates. So what I'm saying here is that the, the template of my page will inherit, will copy, from this base template from the Bootstrap library. And this base template just contains the main links, actually. So instead of putting every page all the links, all the references to the Bootstrap library, you just have one line here, if I have this package installed. How to make it work? It's easy because we just have to, once we create the Flask application, we just have to call the Bootstrap function on that application. So call it, this Bootstrap doesn't return anything. You just call it on the application, and it will modify your application so that the application will know about these additional templates. Yes, abstract templates, I would call them, because they are not real pages. So you just have to do that, and uh, it works. And then you have uh, additional comments, or the form block something, that allow you to inject some of, of your code into specific po portions or points in the template. So you want to add something into the head section, something to the body section, or whatever, you can do that with block. And basically, there are some predefined blocks. There are title, navbar, and contents. We are not constructing the whole HTML page anymore. We are just um, taking a template which has all the HTML boilerplate, HTML add the title and the includes of bootstrap and whatever. And we, so with only one line, we have the basic template. And we need to insert into the template and to customize it by inserting in specific places our own content. The main, of course, block will be the content block that corresponds to the body of the page. But if you want to insert something above the body, we have uh, these blocks uh, to do that. An example will, uh, will make it clear, I hope. So this is a complete template. Extends the bootstrap base. And then I, to define the title of the page, usually I would have uh, to write HTML, head, title, and then the title, slash title, slash head, and along, alongside with all the other information in the heading of the page. In this case, I just uh, say that the content of the title block, which is normally empty, should be this one. And there is a block, uh, navigation bar, which is uh, just at the top of the body. I can fill it with something, for example, with the navigation bar. And the content block, uh, would be the real content of the page. So I can insert this when I need them. Hmm? So how to test all of this? Start testing, at least. Hmm? Just to put something into operation. So I, I thought uh, about an exercise that we will start today and then finish next time if we are happy uh, or if we are good and fast. But it's a, a simple, I uh, called it a, an echo generator. Huh? Something which I, I have two text errors. And whatever I type in the top one will be copied in the bottom one. So basically, you have 
some input text to enter, and immediately I want to echo the text to a second text box. What do, do I mean by immediately? Is that uh, I don't want to enter the text, to, to click on to enter or submit or whatever, just as I write. We are not able to do this right now. We need JavaScript hmm, for doing that. Uh, but so we will learn also that. So for the moment, we will just concentrate on the layout, or on getting this page with this layout. Hmm? And later on, we will add the logic for capturing each keystroke written by the user into the first text area and echo it the, below. And maybe if, to make it more fun, we can apply some transformation to the text along the way. So for example, we may have a reverse transformation that puts uh, the writer text from the last uh, to the first character. This is not garbage characters, but just the same sentence as before written from, the, from uh, right to left instead of left to right. Hmm? It's quite unrecognizable. Hmm? Or maybe also other uh, funny way of transforming. Now you see something, that sometimes the, the sort of flip effect uh, to the text, uh, top to bottom in the mirror. You see, uh, it's, a, it's, a nice, it's, it's a stupid trick that you play, play by using uh, say strange characters that look of other alphabets, uh, of other scripts, uh, that look like uh, our Latin letters uh, in, a, in the top bottom way. Okay. Mm -hmm. So but this is easy because uh, a B is transformed into a P, and the P into a D. But the, the, the T letter is transformed into some letter from some other alphabet that looks like a reversed uh, T. Huh? So there, there's, there are, uh, if you search for flip text, you find tables of conversion. Hmm? And you can also think about other effects uh, hmm? to transform the text. Uh, and these effects should be combined. So you can, if you want, you can apply a reverse and flip at the same time and so on. So read would be an exercise for JavaScript. So we, we, we won't be able to complete it today. But the next step would be to assume, and this is something that will lead us to think about more complex architectures, uh, to assume that the transformation cannot be done inside the browser. So if it's something simple like reversing the string, we will learn JavaScript, and we will learn how to do it in JavaScript. But imagine there's something more complex to do, that the browser doesn't have the information. I don't know, replace every letter with another letter whose frequency is, I don't know, taken from some table from some big statistics. The browser doesn't know all of this big uh, information, big statistics. So you must uh, ask to the server, OK, please translate this string for me. At that point, we will learn how the JavaScript into a page can interact with the server by exchanging JSON. Hmm? By applying, we will apply the REST paradigm here inside the JavaScript. Hmm? So it will be the last. So I took this exercise as something to build in steps. And at every step, we will learn something new. The first step would be applying Bootstrap, right? So we will start from scratch and try to learn from the documentation of Bootstrap mainly, and of Flash Bootstrap also, uh, the library, how to work. OK. So let's go back to the empty page. We want to create this. It's a web page. We create a new project. That's new project. Other. It's a pie project that we call funny echo. Let's presume it's funny. OK, and inside here, let me create a module. that I call the application. 
uh, package may be echo, and the name will be application, app, or web app, hmm? so that it's a bit clear. So we're creating a new application, a Flask application. Something we already know from, from Flask import Flask. And then we have uh, app is creating a new Flask application with the name of our file. And then we run in debug mode. Ah. Right? We just need to create one page. So we define app root, the root page of the website. Index, return, render, template, render template, from the template, index.html. We need to set up the importing here. I don't want this. This was my typo. Render template. OK? Yeah. No. Uh, UR4 takes the name of a function okay. and gives you the HTTP visible URL for that. So whenever you need to have a link, a source link, uh, okay? Sorry. Okay. Run the template takes the template and insert all the parameters. OK. So the logical part for the moment is done. We need to create this template. So we can create it inside a folder called templates with the S. I always forget the S, and nothing works. Inside, I want to create an HTML file called, I called it index.html. And inside this, I can create all my, let's just check that everything works, echo. So let's see if it works. We run the web application. OK. And I try to the browser here. Uh, Localhost, I, I already have a uh, window open. OK. So the, the story is working. But before writing the template, I want to add the Bootstrap library. OK, so that we create a form already with the Bootstrap uh, layout. Remember this font that will change when you apply Bootstrap. So what we need to do is just to Bootstrap the application. Of course, the Bootstrap function needs to be imported from the Flask Bootstrap library. that I already installed before, once for all, with pip. Mm -hmm. So what I did is to modify, you see, I created the application, and then I called the mod bootstrap function saying, please modify my application by giving it extra functionality. And then I can use inside the index, inside the HTML, I can remove everything 
about the general template because they will use the Bootstrap Flag library to do everything. Extends. Let me check because with the slides. Not here, sorry. Uh, Python flags here. Extends bootstrap slash base dot slash HTML. Hmm? The other rule I learned is that everything should be put into blocks in order to be inserted into the page. Otherwise, what happens? Just imagine that instead of the, that extends, you have a, a, a full HTML page. The last line of the page will be slash body slash HTML to close the page. And this code would go after the closing of the page. This is not what I want. I want today to put this code into the content blocks block of the page. So I just have to write that this goes into the content block. Maybe I need quotes. Like, no, block content. And then end block. And finally, the rule of bootstrap is always have a content delimiter. I said you need a div with class content. which is the element, the group, that is used to measure the width of the page and to size everything according to that. So the body, the content body should, you see the booster page was here. Container, sorry, my fault, container. So if we load the page, for the moment we saw that the spacing, the font of this title had changed. Because right now we are applying the, the booster template to this. So we want to create a form. So nothing wrong. We create a form element. Uh, form element with action something. We don't care uh, right now. And with some inputs inside. For example, two text uh, lines. So, sorry. So, let's go and check among the CSS rules or instruction for Bootstrap, how to create forms. So I have one section here that tells me that all the input elements here should have a form control class. Form control to input, text area, or select. And uh, labels and the, so the text element, the input elements, and the corresponding labels should be wrapped into a form group for optimum spacing. Huh? Two lines, but they're very synthetic, but the example helps us understand. Email address, and then the cell for writing the email. You see that it's a div form group, then the label, then the input, and close the div. This is one group, sorry, this one. This is this group of one label and the corresponding text element. And the one below, again, a form group, 
with a label, an input type, and we close, and so on. So all the, all the rest, the space in the fonts is taken care of. So we just need to replicate this. In our case, we have at, at least three form groups. So we have a first class form dash group. a second one, and the third one. The first one is for the input text, the second for the uh, checkboxes, and the third one is for the output text. But the uh, form group gives us the, the form uh, one above the other. Yes. If you... In line? In line, exactly. You all, you, it's always a form group here. But you put form in line into the form declaration. So you can decide later if you want. But the customization are all different classes? No. You see that the form group is always the same. And groups this label with this, uh, say, text. And then everything will be in vertical or in horizontal depending on the class of the form element, not of the individual groups. So, and you see that the, for the other style, which is the horizontal form is always the same. All the elements are the same, form group. And at the top, you, you put the form, form horizontal, and it will restyle everything down. So that you just have to modify one point, and all the form will be relay out uh, with different rules. Why? Because uh, CSS properties inherit from father elements to children elements. So applying a class here will also apply uh, to the children. Not a, not a class, but the properties implied by the class. And uh, in this case, we have two elements, which is a label. Label is normal text element. So I can call it, call it input text. And the actual input element type equal to text. And that should be enough to render some, oh, sorry. And then I have to a class, add the bootstrap class to this element to mark it as, uh, let's see at the beginning, it tells me that everything should be marked with form control. Form dash control. So I go there and refresh the page. Hmm? So it gives me this look. Something that can still be improved is that uh, uh, when I click the label, the focus should go immediately to the text. Right? We are used to that. Whether I click here or I click into the label should, uh, shouldn't matter. This can be done easily by matching the label with the text element. This is basic HTML. With a label element, I say for what element it is. It's a label for the input text, for example. And input text is the ID of an input element. So in forms, huh, when I define a label, I have the for attribute that tells the browser semantically, maybe this label is a different place, but this label will apply to that element. So when the user selects that element, that label, the cursor, the cursor, the, the focus actually, goes immediately into the field. And the for references an ID of another element in the page that would be an input element in most of the cases. So I link the label to the text. And then I probably also would need a, a name attribute. I call it input text again. 
So this input has type text because it's a text line input. The name is what gets sent to the server when I submit the form. The class is used to give the style, and the ID is given as an anchor for labels to attach to, for this label to attach to. So if we save here and refresh, sorry, uh, there's an error, where? No. Visually, nothing changed, but now if I click on the label, you see that the element is focused. It's a visual indication that the two are linked. Also for accessibility reasons or for other reasons, the two are now associated. So they will, they will always be moved together. And uh, the same can be repeated for the output. I just need to change it with output. Output. And then you want to place there. Of course, the output test should not, should not be something writable by the user. So we must learn how to make it disabled. Visible, but not uh, changeable or modifiable by the user. So will uh, Bootstrap tell us something about that? Oh, disable state. Add the disabled Boolean attribute on an input to prevent user interactions. Disabled inputs appear lighter and add the not allowed cursor. And so you just need to have disabled like that, not in a class, just as an additional attribute into the input element. So it's basic HTML, it's not a class. But then Bootstrap will use this information to change. So just add to the second one, disabled, the disabled attribute. I save it, I refresh. Uh, too bad for me because uh, there was already something inside. But uh, you see that if I try to go there, there's a strong indication that I can't write anything. OK? Even if I click here, there's no way. OK, you need to refresh strongly the page. Shift, reload, OK. OK? So it's a basic uh, job of the first time you create some part of the page, you need to look up the documentation, the classes, re read them carefully, and also check the examples. Hmm? And, uh, and then the same code can be reused uh, all over. Um, the, the final step would be to add uh, the checkboxes. So let's go again to the bootstrap code, the forms, and see where, OK, yeah, we have a checkbox. Maybe have an example with more than one. Yes, we do, here. Maybe in line? Here yeah, we do, here. No, very, it's very likely that you will find the example you're searching for. One, two, three will be a set of effects that can be applied on top of our text. And uh, surprise, they are called the checkbox in line inside our group. And the input type checkbox, ID, value, and then the label to print. So I can have uh, two of them. Put them into a group. Right now, I will call them uh, reverse and flip. And if you want to add, oh, sorry. If you want to add any other effects, uh, we can add other options. 
So there are input type checkbox is the normal way of creating checkboxes in HTML. We give an ID, reverse box, I call it, and flip box. You, I use box to remember me, to remind me that there are checkboxes. And the value is reverse. The other value is flip. The value is the string that is being sent to the server when I submit the form. In this case, there is no submission of the form. It's all interactive. It's all on the client. Okay? So we would not, wouldn't need this. But. So if I go there and refresh, okay, I get these two checkboxes that are, I can check on the, on the box or I can check on the label close to it, and they are recognized because they are part of the same label field. So this is the base. Right now we have no server interaction. The server was only used to give me the HTML page and to apply. Uh, let's see what the Flask Bootstrap extension does for me. If I see the source, I see that this is my code. Character by character, by character it doesn't do anything with my content. But it, has, it adds the beginning, the heading, and the tail for including loading scripts. Scripts are loaded at the, at the end. Oh, we'll talk about scripts uh, on Thursday. But scripts are loaded, are loaded at the end of the document to make the page load faster, so that the page can the browser can start showing the page before the scripts are loaded. There's still something that I don't like. This page doesn't have a title, so I could add a title by adding another uh, by customizing another block. No, end block, sorry. And saying that this page is an echo generator. So I add another block. What, what happens is that if I refresh the page and I view the source, everything is uh, I, the same as before, except this title that it was empty. Now it's, uh, it encloses the block that we decide, what, that we define in the template. So there are, if you look at the documentation of Flask Bootstrap, there's a list of available blocks, places in which you want to inject your code. In the HTML, the head, in the body, in the title, add some styles, and, uh, and other. The only uh, warning is that if you want to add something to a block on top of what is already there, for example, let's say you want to add another style sheet, you put that into block styles. You need to have this instruction Super, that is not Superman, and means uh, take everything that was already there and then add this one. So super is the previous content of this block. And then I add, after that, my own style. Or I could add my own style before. I put another, something and then I copy what was there. With the super. Otherwise, if I don't call the sub, the super function, I will replace the previous content of the block with my new content, and so I will lose uh, the the scripts or the styles that were loaded before by the library. This applies mainly to styles and uh, and scripts, uh, because in the other, the content usually is uh, is empty, so I can define it. I don't need to 
call whatever was there before. Uh, but the, uh, this contains all the CSS, CSS styles, uh, so it's already, uh, say, it already contains something, and if I want to add my own, I need first to import the previous ones and then add. Hmm? It's just the only one. Otherwise, if you just redefine a block, you lose the previous CSS styles and you lose all the bootstrap uh, features, actually. Hmm? So uh, these are, there are not many blocks, uh, and there are very few of them that are really useful. Basically, content, scripts, uh, sometimes styles, and title. Or navigation bar, if you want to have. Uh, uh, something that you can learn to do is to create your own uh, templates to inherit. So you could define your own template based on Bootstrap, and you maybe define a navigation bar which is the same for all the website, and then have other template pages to inherit from your own. So instead of writing extends bootstrap base, you extend from your own page. So you create a, an example page, a template page, complete except for the content. You define all the blocks that you need. And the other page will just extend from yours. So you will have everything set up in the same way, all the navigation bar identical in all the pages, and every page just needs to define a, a specific content. You can always even go further by, def by defining additional blocks, custom blocks, uh, to inherit and to redefine. Maybe a menu is always the same, but it's, uh, it's, it gets into the inheritance between um, Jinja uh, templates. OK. I think for today we can stop here with this very nice, so they say, form, but with no behavior. What we learned, what we need to do right now is to add custom behavior to this page. Because right now the only behavior we have is uh, the one that the browser already knows about. I can write into text headers. Now I want to learn, and we know that it can be done with JavaScript, how to write a simple script that can run inside this page and modify what the browser does when I press a letter. You have to wait until Thursday.